All right, the next fact that we want to look at is the empty tomb. This, too, is a fact of history. And it leads to the question, what happened to the body? What happened to Jesus? Dr. Habermas explains. Okay, let's move on to the next step. He died. He was buried. What happened in that tomb? Well, the Christian story is that he was raised, but in between burial and raising, we're told the tomb was vacated. Jesus is leaving, left it alone. Is there any reason to believe that? Again, one of the first points we want to say is, all four Gospels record the empty tomb. And here comes the critics. I told you, I don't like the Gospels. What do we have to back up those early Gospel stories of the empty tomb? Let me give you three big evidences right off the bat. One is that the earliest witnesses to the empty tomb are women. Why is that important? Because if you're making up the story, remember our mo Monday morning quarterbacking scenario, if you're making up a story, putting the words back into the mouths of the earliest Christians sometime later, don't use women for your first witnesses. Why? In the first century, they were not allowed to testify in a court of law. They were not to, believed to be able to tell the truth. We're actually told that. They couldn't testify. So why do you take people who can't go on the witness stand, it would be like making your chief witnesses little children, why do you say, there they are, the tomb's empty, the women saw him, unless, in fact, the women found the empty tomb first? Okay? Second reason. The Jews believe the tomb was empty. Now, there's a fact in history, there's a method in history, rather, that says when your critic admits something, most likely it's correct. If, if you can't stand somebody, and you say he's this and that and this and that and this and that, but he is a brave person. Chances are he's a brave person. And the disciples said the tomb is empty. Now they thought the disciples stole the body. And nobody, virtually no reputable scholars, held that theory for over 200 years because liars don't make martyrs. You explain the disciples' transformation and their honest belief. If they stole the body and lied, you have no explanation for James, you have no explanation for Paul. So that explanation does not make a lot of sense. But what are you left with? If the disciples stole the body, according to the Jews, but that theory doesn't really work, what you have is an empty tomb. What it seems like is that the Jewish leaders are making something up to, or making an explanation to explain a fact. The body's gone. Third argument. You have that early text I gave you a moment ago, 1 Corinthians 15. And Paul's sequence again is, died for our sins, buried, raised, appeared. Now when the same person dies, buried, raised, it appears, guess what? The body's not there. What's gone down has come up. And there's a strong implication in 1 Corinthians 15. You have an overt statement of the burial, and you have a strong implication of the next step, the empty tomb. We could throw some other things in here, as I said. Again, Jerusalem, just like the burial, Jerusalem is the last place to proclaim the empty tomb, because people could say, ah, boys, the tomb's not empty. And they can take you right back there. Acts 13, 29, another early creedal passage, says he was buried and the tomb was empty. So here's another half dozen arguments, but especially I like the women, I like the Jewish admittance of the empty tomb, and I like Paul's creed in 1 Corinthians 15. It's three real tough arguments that say, you know, what the gospel said, they have the ring of truth.